So hey everybody, welcome to Beth Lita's pre-Passover class, and we're going to be looking at a task that is, um, you know, can often cause a whole lot of consternation, uh, you know, approaching madness, you know, the question of uh, searching out and cleaning your house for chametz. Now the reason I say it can cause madness is because um, the, the mitzvah is in the search, not in the discovery. And since the mitzvah is in the search, there's, you know, the rabbis, in as early as the mission are recognized, potentially there could be no end to this, because we are living in a dynamic environment, right? You don't know what's going to happen. What happens when you turn on your fan? Is it going to blow chametz all over your house? If you have a, an adorable dog, is it going to, you know, take a piece of bread and, and drag it all all over your couch? Who knows? Right. So we have only limited. So I, I look at this mitzvah really as one as a technical question, but also and this is part something I really firmly believe, like all technical questions in halacha, actually has deep, real inner wisdom to it. If we pay attention to the way that the law and the practice works, and that it's trying to teach us what it means to take ownership of and have agency within an environment that we cannot control. Right, what happens in a sense when the uh, immovable rock uh, of our of our messy uh, homes meets the unstoppable force of pre Pesach anxiety? Right, like what uh, is there a way for these two things to actually live together? So I want to uh, propose a um, a rigorous preparation for Pesach, one that drives us and pushes us, but not one that breaks us. So we'll see if we can pull it off. Okay. So I'm going to share. Share the screen. <clears throat> Everyone see that okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So we'll start with the Makor. We'll start with the Mikra. Um, look at two important verses, and this is from some of the earliest halacha given to the Jewish people. It's in Parshas Bo. We saw it just uh, about a month and a half ago, I guess, maybe. Um, and this, you know, this part of the Torah is part of what, what Rashi says should theoretically be the first part of the Torah, drawing on the Midrash, because it's, the, it's where Halacha starts. And the Halachas that we get into are the Halachas of Pesach, and that makes sense because the Jews are fresh out of escaping from Egypt. So, and not only just actually, the way, they, by this point, they haven't even escaped yet. So God is, in a sense, starting to transition the people from being an enslaved people to being one with independence and autonomy. And the way you do that is that you have a law. You have a, a system of law. So, we have here Moses saying, Remember this day on which you went free from Egypt, the house of bondage, how the Lord freed you from it with a mighty hand, metaphorically. No leavened bread shall be eaten. If you were to break up this pasuk into two sections, what would, one, what would the first clause say and what would the second clause say? The, what's the first clause about? What's the mitzvah? The first clause, clause is reminding us that Hashem saved us from Egypt and took us out. Good, but what's the command? Egypt. The command is to remember the fact. Very good. And how do we and how do we commemorate nowadays? This is still thing we did. Something. That we did. Uh, now we commemorate it with uh, the complete week of Pesach and definitely by relating the story at the Seder. Great. So the Seder, right? The Seder is uh, a rehearsal. It's a dramaturgical event in which we use our imaginations to imagine as if we too were escaping from Egypt and we use the sacred drama of the Haggadah to relive that experience. Good. How else, though, do we keep this mitzvah? So a blatant, flagrant version, but how else? Let's get some other people. Okay. Think about what we say in prayers. Right, so we say Az Yashir Moshe, we say the song of the sea every day in the morning prayer. So that remembers that that helps us commemorate the leaving of Egypt. And also in one of the paragraphs in the Shema section, in um, in the after we say the actual Shema, we also bring to mind the uh, like before we say Ga'al Yisrael, Sur Yisrael or Vina Amar. We also bring to mind the recalling of Egypt. So uh, remembering the exodus from Egypt is not just something that's just once a year, like it's the Exodus holiday of, of Passover, but it's something we do every day, right? It's structural to Jewish memory. And Shabbos, right? We say, ah, when we make Kiddush, 
We tie the leaving of Egypt to the creation of the world. So this is something that happens every day, every week, every year. Okay? And what's the second clause? Right. Remember this day when it went free for Egypt, house of bondage, blah, 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 God freed you, mighty hand. Part one. Part two? No, um, no leavened bread. No, no chametz. Good, exactly. And it's not clear to the reader, lichora, right at first glance, what's the connection between these two things. Now, if you were just to say, like, intuitively drawing on your own knowledge, your own wisdom, so what would like what would you say? Why why is God hitting the hitting the note of don't eat chametz right after talking about uh, about leaving Egypt? Because it commemorates the leaving. Uh huh. How so? Well, so the story goes because the bread couldn't rise. Okay, great. So they left in a hurry, right in the middle of the night. They got sped up and left, not to eat. And so, in, and the bread on their backs, right, didn't have a chance to rise. So it was this like flat, laffa, you know, flat bread. And that's why on Passover we eat flat bread. Right. Except that when's this commandment being given? Have they left Egypt yet? No, they haven't. They have not. So God is and using what some grammarians will actually call in a way the prophetic perfect, talking about the future as if it's already happened, right? Prophets don't live in just like one time zone. They're like, you know, zooming all over the time stream. Um, but here, I right, think also, before, I, I was one thinking... second, Eric, one second, before right. we have the originary event, the etiology that, that Susie just quite correctly said, right? Why? What's the etiology? What's the origin story for matzah? Yeah, because we had to rush out of Egypt and the bread didn't have time to rise. That's what it says. So why no hummets? It hasn't happened yet. But sorry, how 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 do we know that it hasn't happened yet? Because it happens in the next chapter. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, I was thinking of um, uh, chametz as, uh, in terms of its use, its uh, allegory as pride, and uh, meaning uh, just because you're going to be, um, you know, freed from. Uh, bondage in um uh in um in egypt yeah uh, don't don't start thinking that that uh uh in other ways you're better than anybody else other than in the fact that uh you are part of an you know of people who were chosen to to leave there were people who were left behind don't 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 be so proud about them and don't be so chomets about them <laughs> Okay, so so Eric is, is is skipping forward a little bit conceptually in the sense that chametz is also leavened bread is also related to metaphorically or moralistically, as you know the puffed upness parts of ourselves, the prideful parts of ourselves, and Eric saying in a sense the cautionary note that God strikes at the end is a corrective to the snare of pride. Right, God took us out of Egypt, and the way to take that could be triumphalist, right? Could be. Um, a chauvinist, right? Oh, God took us out. We're special. We're great. Go us. And um, also now, um, what it means to be free is to then be so magnified, so glorified. And God's saying, no, right? Remember that. Remember liberation. Remember your freedom. But also, in a sense, don't let it go to your head. Okay. So it seems like, yeah, so what I want to pay attention to is I don't, and I don't want to stay married to the idea that chametz is actually a pride necessarily, even though that is something we will see later on down the source sheet. But I just want us to pay attention to the, to the fissure between those two sections of the pasuk. That it's not in, in, innately explained, mm, excuse me, it's not innately explained by the pasuk why it is that God is saying don't eat chametz. All right, it's not clear. But it's, and also like there's that little road bump right there. And I, but I, it seems like that chametz in some way is something you need to stay away from because it is programmatically at odds with freedom, with liberation, with the redemption from Egypt. So what's going on? 
Okay, I want us to have that kind of that problem in our heads. So look at another verse. All right, and here we move from don't eat chametz to now what are we supposed to do? So God says, Matzos yeachel es shivas hayamim. Throughout seven days, eat matzah. Velo yero elecha chametz, velo yero elecha seor bechol gvulecha. And no chametz should be seen or found in all of your domain, in all of your boundaries. Now, the question I have here is like a, it's a subtle one, but I want to see if we can generate some insight here. So what's the difference between the commandment not to eat chametz and the commandment that no chametz should be found in one's home? Yeah. Well, it's to prevent you from going, uh, uh, which is, no leaven shall be found with you. So, uh, uh, but uh, it, there might be some somewhere else in um, within the boundary of your uh, of your of your city or of your village or of your of whatever uh, area. Uh, sure. and they want to prevent that too. Okay, great. Yeah, the rabbis get into that in the first uh, in the first chapters of Masechus Pesachim. Um, uh, and I mean, what? you know, like you know, I'll put it this way, and this is maybe, maybe relevant for a lot of Ontario residents. Yes, you might have cleaned your um, your home, your primary home, but have you cleaned your cottage? Um, have you cleaned your pied a terre? Who knows. <laughs> Um, now, luckily, again, this is just quick uh, practicality, Josh, swooping in. If you're not living in, in, a, in a residence for 30 days before Passover, you're not obligated to clean it, and you can actually sell it off. So don't worry, but when you sell off your chametz, and we are doing that, so please feel free to find the link on our website or on our Facebook page, um, make sure to detail every single property that you own when it comes to selling off the chametz. So... But that kind of make sure to detail is what, what does that imply you need to do? You need to take an inventory, right? What it means to do a bidikas chametz, to do a search for chametz means that you need to actually take stock and figure out what are the spaces and places that I need to be paying attention to. So we already start to see that even something as pecuniary as where, are, where is my leavened property stored? already starts to be in some way a mental practice right it, it's a practice of attention we need to use our memory as god was saying above okay so what what else do you see is the difference between the the mitzvah don't eat chametz and the mitzvah don't let any chametz be found in your in your domain i mean one is more much more onerous than the other and also one has to do with like things entering a boundary and the other one has to do with things, um, you know, being taken out of a boundary. Being oh, removed. interesting. Okay. The, the first boundary being your, your mouth. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. okay. So we have two different dynamics. So the way to relate to Hummets, one is you don't want that kind of personal contact with it. And the second one is actually that you need to actively distance yourself from it. Right? One is like, don't let it come close. And the other one is keep yourself far away. One is object oriented and one is self oriented in that way. Okay, great. Any more ideas? Well, you saying self oriented just made me think one is kind of, you know, individual, one is more kind of communitarian in some sense, mm -hmm. right? Like you're talking mm -hmm. about a domain, you start to think about relations to other people, what you Very would nice. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's you know, selling comets is a very interesting practice that is, you know, uni almost universally practiced and also ensures in some ways that there uh, have to be decent relations between uh, the surrounding Gentile community and, and the Jewish community because you need to have allies, right? Like, I'm, I'm, it's curious, actually. I wonder if some, like selling comets is like the 
or origin origin of the ally idea, right? You have to you have to have non-Jews who are supportive of Jews. Like, okay, I'm gonna and, and it's funny. I'm selling my I'm selling our comments, the Shoals comments, my comments, to my friend Martha. Martha has become a very close friend, and like I've and I'm like, okay, Martha, I have to have like a strange conversation with you. I need to tell you about this um, this property sale that you'd be doing a huge favor if you were to do it for me. And um, also, uh, I'm gonna have to buy it back in about a week. Um, please d don't <laughs> like you know you're like letting someone in on this very weird secret of this very uh, strange part of our religion. But in that way, it actually is like it's an, it's an act of entrusting, right? I'm actually bringing someone outside of the community into the community to know something quite like quite particular quite insider right about actually how judaism works right you're actually getting to be part of how the um how the kosher passover sausage gets made okay. josh do you, do you by any chance know how old a custom that is of selling the hummus um i believe it's medieval i don't think it's not in the talmud but it's not that it's not that young either it's it's a pretty well established custom I think also you, you just used the example of Martha. I, I think it'd be useful to look up exactly who the Martha was um, refer, who's referred to in the uh, Christian scripture. It's a very interesting, very interesting choice of word you used. She's a real person. Yeah, she's a real person there. And, no, no, I mean uh, in my life. She's my oh, friend. Oh, okay. I th oh, I thought you were talking about when you said Martha, I immediately thought you're making, you know, sort of a general uh, literary reference to who, who I, this was. I, I value, as always, Eric, your capacious knowledge of, of world religions and literature. In this case, she's just a buddy nope. of mine. Um, okay. All right. Back to the learning. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Okay. So another, another difference I want us to pay attention to, and a lot of Torah is actually learning how to productively pay attention to differences. That's like the Kashya model of learning. And it's never seen chametz and saor, and this is often actually ignored. So chametz is the object, saor is the subject, in the sense that chametz is food that has been leavened, and saor is the leavening agent, yeast, or as I've become quite familiar in this past year during pandemic, a sourdough starter. Right, that's what saor is. But these are two very different things, right? So chametz is the result of a process, but saor engenders the process. So actually, you'll see, and it's a prevalent um, term that's used in rabbinic literature to refer to this, the sexual impulse in the Talmud is often referred to as the saor shebeisa, the the leavening in the dough, right? Like that, that gets like gets your engine going. So that's the metaphor that the rabbis use. Um, but it's an interesting point, right? In terms of like, what is the part? We already start to see the way in which chametz or saor are used in these not just physical descriptions, it's not just like literally yeast or literally bread. Now we already start to see because, I mean, I think something's worth noting that's become less so in this like anti-carb world, but maybe now with pandemic and everyone's, all the hipsters are baking bread, now we're bringing bread back to the center of human civilization again. But like bread is symbolic of human civilization, right? Bread is the processing of a raw material, the application of skilled labor, and of technology, i.e. fire, to create um, a change in the substance. Right? Bread is like the first chemistry. Bread is science. Right? So bread is something deeply, centrally human, vis-a-vis -vis nature. Right? The way that humans take hold of nature, influence nature, um, and change nature for our own ends. So there's something, and I mean this in a non-critical way, egoistic about chametz, because it's the insertion of the self or the person into nature to change it for our needs or our preferences, our taste, right? We're manipulating nature to make it fit us better. So what about that kind of subtle empowerment? does God insist on cautioning us about, right? When we're talking about Pesach, when we're talking about liberation, in a sense, the part of the question is what in us 
is important and essential, but maybe we need to, again, keep a watch on, keep a check on, or what does it mean for us to remove ourselves from the equation to let something take hold, to let something unroll? So these are the kind of the big questions I want to leave us with. Now let's get into, into the text. So this is a commentary from the Ha'amak Davar, whom I think everyone's familiar with by now because I love him so much, the Nitziv, Naftali Tzvi of Berlin, a student of the Velazhen Rebbe. Um, so he is commenting on what we saw just above, this kind of shift from, remember the exodus from Egypt, or don't eat chametz. So he says, don't eat chametz. Why? In order to enroot lahashrish, beautiful word. The word shoresh means root in Hebrew, and lahashrish, it's the causative form of the verb, to cause to root. So don't, um, second, there we go. In, so why don't we eat chametz? So that we will cause to root in our heart, a mindfulness or a zechira, remembering, through an action, to remind one of the command not to eat chametz. Okay, so the action here seems to be zechira, right? The remembering, the seder, right? The seder or remembering uh, the exodus from Egypt is the action we need to catalyze, to trigger us remembering not to eat chametz. And why? And here we get to the point about bread. Because matzah doesn't require any intervention of human skill. And the word for human skill is tachbolet. And tachbolet doesn't mean like just skill. It means like cunning trickery. Because that's like, it's you know, what do we do with bread? We manipulate it, right? We apply our, our wiles to it. Um, so matzah is, in a, what is matzah? It doesn't require any intervention of human skill, which would enable the dough to rise than just what the flour and water would do on their own. So what's matzah? Matzah is nature taking its course, right? Matzah is what happens when you have flour and it gets wet. That's, and, and then you, and then you put it in fire. That's it. Uh, you know, this is my first, I said this to a couple people before, but like this is my first Pesach as, a, as, as somebody who bakes regularly. And I get what the Ha'amek Davar is saying. Because to make bread takes an immense amount of attention, right? Every 25 minutes, I need to take the dough out of the, you know, the, the not too hot, not too cold oven. And then I stretch and fold it. And then I cover it again and I put it back in the oven. Then 25 minutes later, I take it back out and I stretch and I fold and I do, right? And then I, and I, and I shape it and I have all these doodads, right? Um, matzah, you're free. I don't need to get up at five in the morning to make matzah. I mean, you should. But like, you don't need to contort yourself to make matzah. Not only that, but that ruins it. For me to try to make matzah better, means it's traif. Matzah exists because it is our actually refraining from trying to pochki it, from thinking that we can improve it. Matzah is that it's good enough. It's good enough on its own. And we keep our tachboles away from it. We keep our, 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 our interventions away from it. We don't intervene. We let it do its. We let it do itself. So, what kind of freedom then is matzah vis-a-vis -vis chametz? It's the freedom from ourselves. It's the freedom from the notion that we are a necessary ingredient to fix something, to correct something, to make it better, to disrupt, to break. Right? All these like Silicon Valley words. Right? To find a way to um, change so that it can become better. Now that is true, and that deserves its place. But matzah, Pesach, a holiday of meddling, exactly, Susie. A holiday of freedom, right? It's, we have to, to have a holiday in which we're free to explore, free to manifest, free to be redeemed, free to have a relationship with God. In some ways, we need to get ourselves out of the way. We need to actually learn how there already is what's there, and actually, that it can actually it can it can unfold on its own. 
that we can be a partner with it rather than the executive director of it. So matzah, matzah commands us. We don't command matzah. 18 minutes. Make sure the water is filtered. What, when you harvest the grain, keep an eye on it, right? So matzah, you know, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Matzah enslaves us. Not, I'm not going that far. But matzah, I think, helps us like realize the, that the freedom, I think as Eric actually was hinting at before, that the freedom that we were given by God is not dominion. But it's the freedom to be ourselves and also then the freedom to allow other things to have freedom as well. Matzah is free too, in its subtle way. We allow matzah to be free. Um, right, it's enabled the dough to rise just as what the flour and water do on their own as created by God. That's not the case with chametz, he says, which is defined by human skill, meddling in Susie's word, to induce the dough to rise using leaven, using yeast. Thus, matzah is a sign of Israel's standing solely through the divine spirit. So matzah has a completely reversed and inverted meaning now. Right before, we think of matzah as symbolizing lechem oni, halachma anya, right? The bread of poverty, bread of affliction. This is the bread of affliction, right? You can remember all of our grandparents saying that. Um, but now matzah is a symbol of something else, independence, dignity, autonomy. Matzah becomes a symbol and a, a, a mnemonic for, not for how we were, but for how we are and how we can be the dignity of what it means to actually have the freedom to be yourself on your own terms. It's a very, um, it's a surprising reading, but it's, it's, and it's a, it, again, it's a revolutionary one because it completely inverts our notion of what matzah is, or it gives us an additional understanding of what matzah can be. But it's the, yeah, the, 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 re, the regal dignity of simplicity, right? Um, of not trying to meddle, not trying to put all those preservatives in it. Right, but like a, it's a, 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 a something in its most basic elemental form. It's like imagine actually what it means to strip yourself down to your most basic elemental form. Right before you put on the coat of what your boss expects of you, right, or the the jacket of what of what your friends see you as or whatever. Right, it's just you on your own terms. That radical kind of point of freedom. That's matzo. Josh, it reminds me. Again, of, nothing is nothing is the answer. Just an idea, something to think about. Yes, uh, Lauren. I, I was just going to think that it's like being like ish tam v'shalem. Mm, it's it's mm, just oh, that's simple. That's how Yaakov is described in the Torah. And whole, it's perfect. Mm, mm -hmm. And in which case, probably, if you want to take it further, we should probably only be eating uncooked fruits and vegetables to keep it going. Yeah, raw food Pesach. You got it. I'm going for it next year. Oh God, no! <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. You can enjoy your uh, your carob date bars or whatever you want to have. Uh, I'm having my fruit slices. Okay. And by fruit slices, I mean my gelatinous fruit slices, covered in sugar. Um, oh no, not those! Ew. Delicious. So good. Ah, oh, it's the best pace I've treat. By one package. <laughs> I have. Listen, I have my package, and I will be rationing it. Yeah, sure. She wanted to ask a question. Oh, no, sorry. Went up by mistake. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay. So here's the Sefer Echinach. Who wrote the Sefer Echinach? Great question. Nobody knows. It was a book that came out in the early 14th century, if I remember correctly. And it is a commentary on all of the mitzvot. So it is one of what's called a Sefer Sifreha mitzvot, uh, like book of mitzvahs. And it actually goes in order of the Parsha. Like a lot of mitzvah books like Rambam's or Rambam's gloss on Rambam's book goes like they order the mitzvahs. But here actually it's more like a commentary on the Torah. So each Parsha, the Sefer Chinuch comments on the, on the, on the mitzvahs that are contained in that Parsha. And he talks about their kind of their immediate notion, you know, their pshat, kind of gives some moralizing ideas and brings it further. Really cool text actually, really recommend it. 
Um, so here he has on the mitzvah from this parsha on on eating chametz. But interestingly, what does he call it? Actually, and very uh, very nicely, actually, uh, Leon intuited the Sefer Chinnitz language. He doesn't call it bedikas chametz. He actually calls it here harchakas from the chametz to keep yourself far away from chametz. That's a, it's a very I haven't seen that lushin before. That's very interesting. So he says keeping ourselves away from chametz which is made through the duration of time, right? If you get what that means, like what is leavening? Leavening is a, is a catalytic chemical process induced by, induced by the bacteria, right, in the yeast that takes time, right? You have, to let, you have to feed the sourdough starter so it gets bubbly and it starts rising, right? And then you put the sourdough starter in the dough and then you let the dough sit to rise and you manipulate the dough by folding it or kneading it or whatever you do and then you let the dough rest and um, you do a bench rest and the dough rises. So what does it mean to bake bread? I mean, to bake, a, 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 you know, again, all bread is sourdough to the ancient people, right? They didn't have packaged yeast. So they're making sourdough bread and how long does it take to make sourdough bread? It's a 24 hour process, right? So chametz is, du is duration, right? To make, to, to make a leavened loaf of bread is to be very conscious of time, but not matzah. Right, matzah is 18 minutes. Bing, bang, boom. That is it. So, keeping ourselves away from chametz. Sorry? All right. Brings our minds closer to acquire the trait of zerizas, alacrity, which is an English word that's not really a translation. This, uh, zerizut in Hebrew means, it's like alertness. Um, it's, it's like, imagine all the good things of being anxious right it's it's not bad it's good it's like you are it's like it's like you're coursing with adrenaline and you're playing like a sports game right and like you're like perceiving reality differently because your your senses are so on right that's zerizas right it's it's alertness it's quickness to to act but not in a rash way in a way in which it's like you're full of power and energy but it's a, you, so through making matzah, right? So chametz takes time. It's a slog. But matzah, you got to be on the ball because if you don't take it out right after 18 minutes, it's not kosher. So making matzah is a practice of attention and a practice of zerizas, of alertness, alacrity, nimbleness, quickness in the service of God. As Chazal say in Pirkei Avos, be light as an eagle, swift as a gazelle and mighty like a lion in the service of god so matzah right the practice which is like kind of the first fast food in a way right it, it becomes uh, an, an embodied practice of what it means to be quick for the sake of god for not being sloggy for not being uh, slothful right to first thought best thought as the great rebbe del close would say um, who's, he invented uh, improvisational comedy. Uh, so he said, first thought, best thought, right? And so what is what does it mean to be Zerizus? It actually means to get, I think, I, I put this after this one, to get some stuff out of the way, right? To get your self-consciousness out of the way, to get all the buffers out of the way, all the ways in which we like pick apart and we question ourselves. It's, just, it's a certain orientation of trust that I have what it is in me to act now. Like, I, it, I am enough. So before we're talking about how matzah is enough on its own, matzah is just God and nature taking its course with minimal involvement from us. Here, we're actually embodying, we're internalizing those values, saying, I'm actually enough right now. I don't need to go to math. I don't need to go to a master's program to be able to serve God. I don't need to, I mean, it's a lifelong process. We should keep on be learning, we should keep on be growing, et cetera, et cetera. Fine, but every, at every node, at every point in that process, you are already enough that you can act now. God wants from you what you have now. And the question is, will you give it up? Or are, you, are you on the ball? So matzah as this reorientation of our perspective that what is now in us is wanted and we can give it. Okay. Um, this here is in a way, I think, so this is from Ravino Bachia. I'm going to just kind of give it over outside. We're not going to get too deep into it. Um, but actually, I think some, from what partially from what Eric was intuiting earlier, 
that chametz here actually symbolizes to Rabbeinu Bachia midas hadin, the symbol, of, the the characteristic of judgment, and that's not what we embody, right? We are not freed on Pesach to become conquerors, per se. We're not freed on Pesach. That's not what freedom entails. It's dignity, right? So we don't actually eat the chametz, which is judgment on Pesach. Pesach is not a day of judgment. Pesach is a time of freedom. So those two do not jibe together. So you can look at that on your own when I uh, link to the source sheet after. But I want to also make sure we stay in the text, and that one I think would be a little bit more time consuming we have time for now. Joshua. Yes, sir. Ari, hi, how you doing? Hey, Ari. Could, could, thank you. Could, could, could the idea of judgment being learning to judge, like be, becoming more like, you know, judging appropriately situations as opposed uh, to being judged? No, so that's not usually what Dean is used to mean. Dean here is more like, um, like using force, but in a directed way. I think the word you're thinking of is more like discernment. Bina, like, like Bina, like Bina. It's not, so Din doesn't- Yeah, that's more Bina. Yeah, it's more like discernment. Yeah, you no, know, because it's interesting. Would you look at, you know, if you look at the Gematria of Matzah, sorry to apologize for throwing that out. It's 135, right? Which yeah. is the Gematria of the, of the two names, the Ayin Beit and the Samach Gimel names, the idea of Hochman Bina. So on, on some level, I'm wondering if eating Matzah allows us to reach a higher level of discernment. That's the word I'm looking for. Discernment. I am absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, so this is not a class about matzah. This is a class about hummus. So get your matzah gematrias out of here, Ari. That's a different okay. class. <laughs> no, but uh, no, we're, we're, we're mostly focusing on, I think, the dialectical wisdom of what is it that when, when God's telling us to clean our house from hummus. No, I did dip a little bit into matzah. So you're. I'm just joking around, um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of Torah about what matzah, you, you what it. matzah symbolizes, and very much the notion of matzah as inducing a kind of enlightenment, matzah as like what access we have to the manna nowadays, all over Kabbalah especially. So you're definitely intuiting something that's there, like matzah as like heavenly bread, in its yeah in its simplicity, and also uh, bread bread that brings enlightenment and wisdom. So you're definitely on, you're definitely onto something. But that, it's just, it's not going to be what we're looking at here, but you're definitely okay. well, I was not. Just, I was just wondering, like, applying to judgment. So you're, you're looking at it different. You're, you're yeah, no, no. That's like the classic Midas Hadin, kind of like what God, the faculty that God uses to uh, punish, right? To, to, be, to, to apply force. Okay. So here we have the Mishnah Torah. This is the law code of the Rambam. The Rambam. Um, he says, and he summarizes the law. We should know the law, of course. It says, according to the rabbis, Medivere Seifer, one must search for chametz. Search after chametz is actually a more accurate translation. Lechapes acher chametz. In hiding places and hidey holes. And remove it from one's entire domain. Okay, that's the mitzvah of bedikas chametz. And that's really the essence of this class, is what we're talking about. Searching out the chametz. So what do you need to do? You need to search everywhere that chametz is stored for to make sure that there's no chametz lying around. And remove it. Get rid of it. Also, by rabbinic decree, one should search and remove the chametz by lamplight. And this is why, you know, the classic chametz search kit is what? It's a spoon with a feather and a candle. Um, if you do not have a candle on you, um, you can use your, a flashlight or like an iPhone light or something like that. Do not use your overhead light. Do not use daylight. Um, why? Because we're using a pointed light because it needs to look into something. Whereas an overhead light or daylight are going to cause cast shadows. Some you said, right? A more intense, bigger light actually makes it harder to look, causes more obscurity. So. But a flashlight candle can peer into crevices and cracks, nooks and crannies. Um, and you do it the 14th day. This year we do it. Yeah, we still do 14. Because all the people are then at home and lamplight is best for searching. Right? You use, a, you use a flashlight to look for things. And we do not, um, and this is very interesting. And you actually, you don't learn, you don't, you don't go to the base medrash. You don't like, you don't, you're not Kovea Itim Latora uh, when you search the comments. In other words, it's priority enough to actually justify Bitzel Torah. 
which I find very interesting. There's a couple other mitzvahs that are like that, like escorting a, uh, escorting a chosen kala to their chuppah, right? The, the, the wedding couple to their wedding ceremony, uh, escorting a, a corpse to its burial, um, and, because, and searching for chametz is also something that is a priority enough. You, you schedule it, and it's something that you commit time to. It's something that really requires our time and attention. So, um, and you shouldn't, you make sure not to read an, uh, read an engrossing book that you'd be distracted by it. So don't do that. Okay, because all of us are sages here. So he's summarizing, the Rambam is summarizing what we, what's in the Mishnah. And the Mishnah says, the Mishnah is the earliest example of, I think, a sane limit on what prepping for Chometz, for Pesach entails. Because it says, basically, if you were to let the fluid, dynamic conditions of what it means to live in the world dictate how you search for Chometz, there would be no end to it. So we have reasonable limits in terms of what we are expected to do when we look. So, what is it? You don't worry. For chashash means to worry. You don't. So, do not worry is a mitzvah in a sense. Don't worry. If maybe a weasel took a piece of chametz and dragged it from one room to another, from one property to your shed or something like that, from place to place, because if so, may. May chatzar chatzar, may ear to ear from, because if you were to think, oh, he dragged from one room to another, from my house to my shed, and sure, maybe he brought it from one block to another block, or maybe from here to Kitchener Waterloo, and then there would be no end to it. So the Mishnah is circumscribing what a reasonable limit of expectation is. And I want to read the Rambam, not just as explicating what the Mishnah is getting at, but I actually think that these two work as a, like a yin-yang pair. Uh, before, there's, in the Gemara on that, there's a wonderful thing on the pun on, on the, the name Hulda, which... Yeah. Uh, which, uh, One I of the rabbinic think, wives. Uh, no, isn't she a prophetess? Who, is she oh, sorry, yes. I'm, yes, she was a prophetess. Yeah, that that, and they make a joke saying that is is a weasel a prophet, but uh, I think that in this uh, case, the, yes. Gemara, the Gemara is being very careful to say that uh, uh, Hulda is uh, is an important person, and you should remember that. Right, true, but weasels, however, weasels have a limited amount of importance for us. Yeah. So I want to see the Rambam here and the. And the Mishnah as working in a, in a complementary fashion. The Mishnah is saying, don't go crazy. And that's true. But you can only say don't go crazy if you've done what Rambam has said, in which you've blocked out a real significant amount of time in which you're going to rigorously search out your home. Right? So what we have is, I think, both an asp like a high aspirational standard of we thoroughly and rigorously check our home. You block out time. You, you, you come home from the yeshiva. You really make this a priority, but also you do a good job and you believe that you did a good job. You trust yourself. You are put in your own stead, right? You are put in your own care to hold yourself accountable. And here, how, and here we have actually the way in which searching for chametz becomes a pageantry for what it means to hold oneself accountable both in the sense that we hold ourselves to a certain rigorous standard, right? We don't want to just slump into, 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 into slothfulness, right? We don't want to just like take this and just get away with it. Um, but on the other hand, also, if we have such an unreasonable standard that we never see ourselves as being able to meet it, then that's going to induce despair. It's going to drive you mad. Right, that's not a growth, that's not a mindset that, that encourages growth. So we need to have both the rigor and the aspiration of what it means to hold herself like to a high standard, but on the other hand, the compassion and the belief and the trust that we're doing our best. So we're gonna follow this journey all the way to the end. Okay? And we're gonna see how actually that this seemingly technical housekeeping standard is in truth, I believe, 
a deeply spiritual embodied practice that has real impact on our psyche if we if we have the right framework for it if we have the right setting for it so let's look so this is a Avedis, the Avaita Sisrol from the Magid of Kuznets, who was a early 19th century Hasidic Rebbe. And he said, he made a very, he made a very medayic point on this that I really want to focus on. Beautiful exegesis of this. I want to also, before I do, I want to, I want to encourage us not to get hung up on the, on his, on his insisting on, like Hamid says, like the Yetzer Hara, on like the evil urge in us, so the bad part of ourselves. I actually don't think we need to like overemphasize that. I don't think that I don't think the teaching hangs on that. So he says, anywhere that Chametz is brought into requires search. That is to say, each person must check in the places in which it is the way of the Yetzer Hara, i.e., Chametz, to dwell. Each person searches according to their particular self. One must search oneself there, clean out, and return the tshuva and complete commitment not to continue in that way to do tshuva for what one has, secure in knowing that God will forgive. So there's a couple few things going on in this um, that I want to I want to I want to note. But first, before I before I, I paste on my reading, what 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 sticks out to you? What do you take? I think that today? the line uh, secure in the. Uh, knowledge that God will forgive. I think that's that's difficult for a lot of us. It is. I very much agree with that. It's also, I mean, Pesach in this way, everything we're learning about Pesach from like the rest of this year can equally be applied to Yom Kippur. Right? Yom Kippur is the Yom Kippur is the happiest day of the year because it's the day in which God forgives us. Right, all the hard work pays off is actually the message of, of Yom Kippur. I think Pesach becomes an example of like all the hard work drives you crazy. And then you're exhausted. And then you have Seder. And it pays off because the brisket, sure. But I think if we bring actually the payoff to a little bit closer here, that the searching that we do is productive and it's effectual. It's effective. Like we do it. You search out yourself and something works, something happens, and you can believe that. Of course God will forgive, because God understands, because God sees that you're trying really hard. Now, another thing I want to bring our attention to is the, personalist, is the personalized view, the subjective view that the Magid is saying here. He's saying, each person must check in the places in which it's the way of the hum, where the chametz dwells. My, I keep chametz in certain places in my home. That, Marvin Myrna, right? You keep your chametz in different places in your home. Each of us have different tasks. Each of us have different chametz itineraries in front of us. Because what's the search really about? It's about what it is that makes us us, right? Where it is that we have something to work on in ourselves. It's not like there's one size fit all chametz, but really what this entails is you are learning how to get to know yourself again so that you can do this work. It's an itinerary into yourself by searching out, by looking in all the nooks and crannies, what is Badika's chametz really about? It's reacquainting you with yourself. And in that way, I think it's also reacquainting. I mean, I think what we have is this one-to-one -one mapping between you and your home you get to know your home a lot better, a lot differently. Like when you do a spring cleaning, you like reignite a relationship with you in your home, right? After a deep clean, right? You, you, you sink, you know, I, uh, my, my mom, God bless her, got me a vacuum uh, as, a, as a present. Now, I borrowed my super's vacuum. It's not like I never vacuumed, but I didn't vacuum that much. So she got me a vacuum and I used it. Mom, there's evidence. I used it. And now my carpet's so clean. Like I would do push-ups, like knuckle push-ups on my carpet. And I got pimples on my knuckles because the carpet was so dirty. <laughs> That's gross. But like the point is like now my carpet's so clean. 
And I just feel so more at ease in my home. I have a dust allergy and now I'm not sneezing as much. Right? So like our home demands attention based on what needs attention. My carpet needed attention. Other people's walls need attention, whatever it is, right? Something's always nagging at the back of our minds that make us feel uneasy at home. And to commit ourselves to a deep clean of our home, the result of which is we have a sense of ease again, of feeling satisfied, feeling connected, feeling comfortable. But that takes work and that takes attention. Second point is that it has a result, right? It has a result, it works. And as we do that, we then come to realize, oh, actually it had become normal to me, but that had been really bothering me. Heidegger, the philosopher, says actually that um, we only, in a sense, realize what normal is when something's bothering us. Right? So the, what bothers us ends up teaching us something about us. It teaches us what it is that gets hung up on in us, right? What it is that we need, what it is that we, that's what it is that we care about. So cleaning our homes ends up becoming a way to discover our relationship to our environment, but also discover something about ourselves as well. And the way in which each of these things is tailored to each of our individual personalities, each of our, each of our individual selves. And accordingly, says the Magid of Kuznets, he says, and thus, the Mishnah says, any place into which chametz is not brought does not require search. That's the second half of the Mishnah. And that's a really interesting point. Because you don't go searching for chametz in the bathroom. I'm assuming you don't bring a sandwich into the bathroom. Should not eat in the bathroom, says Halakha. Just worth noting. Um, you don't bring a sandwich into the bathroom, so you don't have to drive yourself crazy. Right? If you don't eat in your bedroom, you don't need to search your bedroom. You don't need to give yourself more tsuris than you really need. You only need exactly as much tsuris as what's going to help you. The point isn't the tsuris. The point is the help. And he says, and this is a really, oh, this, not, this reading knocked me on my tush. Incredible. He says, there's a remez here. There's a hint. It seems that there are people who do not search out their own selves, but rather pay attention to the acts of others. Regarding them, the Tana says, a place that Chametz is not brought does not require search. That is, one should not watch over the acts of other people, but only attend to and endeavor to heal oneself. I find that an immensely insightful point. One, that he is, again, emphasizing that the search for chametz is a deeply personal act, a deeply personal process. And the point of it is to reacquaint you with yourself so that if you are looking at, like, other people's personalities, quibbles, faults, and trying to paste them on top of yourselves, if you're letting social media do your thinking for you about what's wrong with you or what you need to pay attention to, you're then capitulating to just becoming invisible, to be becoming part of the just the generic you, the generic person. Or if you use searching out chametz as a way to basically be a busybody and concern yourself with other people's, I don't know, other people's searches, and then accordingly abdicate your own personal responsibility to look in on yourself. Now, I don't think it's to say we don't have responsibility for it in, in regards to other people, but to rather say that it's so easy, and I see this happening a lot, to lose contact with an awareness of what it is that makes us the special individuals that we are, because we just kind of meld ourselves into these larger categories, these larger groups. Chametz, this in the search thereof, is about re-realizing re who it is we specifically are and what it is that we specifically need to have a clean house. What it is that we need to feel fresh again. What is it that we need to feel back to our roots? Little later, back to who we are. Good count. I'm sorry? Good count. 
Um, no, sorry. That's... So I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's this very delicate two-step. We pay attention to what we need to work on, not as this kind of punishing look for chametz where it's not kind of mentality, but we learn to look for chametz where it is. We learn to pay and we, we realize, we take stock, we take account, and we realize what it is that needs attention and we devote ourselves accordingly. So we gain wisdom in relationship to ourselves and also coupled with compassion, right, the compassion that contains rigor, right, a reasonable limit in terms of what it means to actually give ourselves help versus the kind of driving yourself crazy because you need to become perfect like that other person. We take on exactly the work that we need to do and that's all because that's who we are. And that then gets us ready to for the Omer in which we then build ourselves back up. Right? This is stripping ourselves down to our studs. And then in the Omer, we then focus on each part of our personality, each part of our traits, our midos, and we work on actually what it means to fill ourselves back up again. And then finally with the climax of Shavuos, no spoilers, in which we can offer chametz on the altar. That's the Gavaldic thing. That the whole process of Pesach, of getting rid of all this stuffed upness, bringing ourselves back to the core, we build ourselves back during the Shiras Omer, such that now we're able, now we're safe, now we're capable of what it means to bring the fullness of chametz, the only time in the year that the chametz is offered on the altar. It's an incredible, ah, oh, such a sophisticated spiritual choreography. I really am, I'm really like bowled over by the wisdom of Torah. Um, but only if we can like, you know, only if we notice it, you know, it's really, it's so dependent on that noticing. So here, I um, just want to bring a quick teaching from the uh, Piazetsna Rebbe, who's the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, um, Kalanus Kalman Shapira of, Piaz of, of Piazetsna. And in his book, this is the only book he published in his lifetime. The rest of the books he wrote were published, were uh, buried in manuscript form under the floor, under the, under the earth of the Warsaw Ghetto in the Einik Shabbos archive. Um, this is uh, his book he published in the 20s. Uh, in which he basically was a pedagogical theorist. He was an education reformist. And he was trying to envision what a, a better Jewish school system would look like, what pedagogy, what teaching, what learning can look like in a much more progressive and healthy way. It seems like he, like these ideas accord with things written by Dilthey and by Russell and other people in the early 20th century progressive pedagogy movement. And, um, you know, unclear what he's, un you know, there's ideas what he was reading or what he wasn't, but his writing really stands up next to it. He says, um, but I mean, so it's about pedagogy, but it really, it's about what it means to be a good Jew, of course. Uh, so he writes, he says, He said, if you're just going to take on yourself this idea, theoretically, generically speaking, the other person's chametz, right? I'm going to be a good Jew. I'm going to be a good Jew. That you're going to be, you're going to take on yourself, you're going to be a good Jew, you're going to serve God. He says, it's not enough. Why? Theory and practice have to come together. Rak gam bi pratius midois haraos vechasronos acherata makir bacha hishtadel lesakin basha zu shel hisrom mus. Right? When you are in specific, in particular analysis, looking at the parts of yourself that need attention, the chametz, right, the midos raos, the aspects of ourselves that we're not satisfied with, that we're not happy about, the lacks. Right, the parts of ourselves that are disappointing, whatever it is, which you recognize. Strive, hishtadlis, right? Strive, toil, labor to heal in that time of your elevation, right? Of, of, your, of your getting yourself enthusiastic about this. But when it's the time that your heart is lit a fire, right? You're enthusiastic. You're like, oh yes, you're motivated. You're like, I'm gonna be better. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna find all the chametz. Tov shelo yarbe Don't drive yourself crazy. 
And here, actually, I think we bring ourselves back to the takbolis part, the takbulais part above, right? Matzah is a bread that's not interfered with that we keep ourselves away from the meddling in Susie's words, right? Away from the interventions, from the application of our cunning. And here he used the term cheshbonos, right? You're like having too many ideas, right? Don't make this an overly wrought theoretical endeavor in which you're making it more complicated than it has to be. Don't, in a sense, get sucked into the slime. Don't obsess over what it is that you feel like you're missing. Don't obsess over what it is that you feel like is wrong. Rather, what Davin, learn, follow your heart. Vayislahev means follow your enthusiasm, follow your passion, vayiskarev, and you'll become close, as it said in the, in the holy books. That's where I want to stop. You know, interestingly, it says, hishtadel, right? You want to strive, you want to work hard but you don't want to become stuck. And this is very important. You know, this is like something that's challenging in therapeutic work, right? And what it means to like get into some very difficult stuff is that it's so easy to feel defined by these things, right? That you're like caught in the struggle against these things, that you're defined by what you need to fix. But the Piazetzner says, no, it's important to work hard. You need to recognize what it is that needs attention. And then you draw on your passion, you draw on your goodness, you draw on your enthusiasm and devote, you, devote yourself to good deeds, to virtuous acts, to prayer, to your intention, meditation, to your learning to your mitzvahs, to what brings excitement and, and light to your life, that brings you close to your source. That brings you close to your goal. It's not obsessively tinkering with the broken machinery of yourself. It's actually seeing how yourself is a robust and working organism that can still do the good. And you dive into the good. You pour yourself into the good. <laughs> We don't forget that at the end of cleaning for Pesach, we have a home that's ready for Seder. Right? What we're doing when we clean our home is we're bringing ourselves to be able to have the thing that we love. And it's in our reach. We can do it. We can do it. The search for chametz is not without end. If we went according to the Havamina in the Piazetzner, you would just ha you would just be sticking your head in every nook and cranny until the last minute of Pesach. And how is that a way to prepare for a holiday of freedom? We do the hard work we need to pay attention to the things that we need to realize need attention. We give those things the attention that they deserve. And we build from that, that momentum, that energy to carry us into what it means to actualize this holiday. Um, more to be said, but I want to close with uh, a powerful teaching that I learned from my friend uh, David Polsky, who's a rabbi in, in Detroit. Um, and he, and you know, it's a, you know, it's a good source sheet when there's a text that Safari it doesn't have. Uh, so this is from Rabbeinu David Bonfi, who was a Rishon, a medieval rabbi, I believe in Italy. Um, and here he is writing an apologia for one of the first Rashi's in Pesachim. Rashi says it's because of Bedikas Chanetz that actually frees us from the Isser, from the forbidden premise of Bal Yerae Bal Yimotze, that you shouldn't see any Chanetz and you shouldn't find any Chanetz. So what is it that removes us from the ambit of those potential problematic uh, states? 
it's searching for chametz. So there's an objection to that, saying, wait a second, what do you mean searching for chametz? That doesn't get the, rid of the chametz. Getting rid of the chametz gets rid of the chametz. How is it that searching is the effectual act? So Rabbeinu David defends Rashi's point, as every true Jew would. He says, She'im datam lomar she'en adam yotzei midei iser bal yara val yamatzei el bibitul v'lo vidika, right? So someone could say that, ah, it's only getting rid of the chametz, not searching for chametz that, that um, effectively prepares you for Pesach. He says, If you're saying it's just getting rid of it, then that means then you might not search. Because if the point of it is burning it, and that's what's going to like loose us from our concern about comets, or flushing it, or crushing it and scattering it to the wind. If the point is the destruction of chametz, then you've, if the point is the conclusion, you can easily lose the process. But Badika's chametz is all about the process, the process as practice, the practice as process. To Zevadai Eno, he says, no, 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 no. How is it that Badika frees us from the anxiety about Hametz? It's because what it is, is that we search according to our capacity. So who, in whose hand is it to prepare us for Pesach? in no one's hands but your own. Now that could be a mentality that could drive you mad. But that's why the necessary corollary to that is what he's about to say after. The Torah wasn't given to the angels. God is not expecting there to be no chametz in our house. Boom. God's expecting us not to be able to find it. That's very different. Right? What's the language? Bal yei bal yei May it not be seen by you, and may it not be found by you. So if you search, yei if you uh, scour, yei then it's in your power to get rid of the chametz. You can do it. You can do it because God doesn't expect perfection. God expects an honest effort. God expects you doing your best. Kifi kocha. You do your best. That's what God wants because your best is enough. Matzah is the result of searching for chametz, the enough bread, the bread in which we don't need to do extra, we don't need to intervene, we do exactly as what we're able to do. We draw on our resources, we make a real honest effort, we push ourselves, but with the understanding that God wants exactly what we can give. God doesn't want the chametz of somebody else. God wants your chametz. God doesn't want you to look in other people's storage houses. God wants you to look in yourself. Let yourself, in a sense, guide the Pesach cleaning process, both in terms of the contours of what it entails, right, the limits that you might have in doing it, but also the object of it to let it also be a process of regaining acquaintanceship with yourself, getting to know yourself better, what it is you need, who it is you are, what you're bringing yourself to the core of. That we're not just preparing our homes for Pesach, we're preparing ourselves to be free. Chag um, And for real, Sameach. Like, may this be a joyous process. May this be something that empowers us, that makes us feel proud of the labor and of our devotion and of our energy, of our giving ourselves over to what God, exactly what God expects, knowing that what we have in us is exactly enough.
those two things can come together. Um, Gladstone? 